All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is a panel all about data contracts. So very excited about that. It's the hot topic of the conference, I think, as well. Um, we'll talk a bit about uh, the why, the what, uh, but also the pitfalls. I think um, we've got a lot of lessons and learnings, uh, a lot of people with experience here. So um, I think um, we'll be in for a treat today. Um, let's maybe start with introduction. So my name is Martin. I'm one of the co-founders of Soda. If you've not seen our boot, it's just there. Um, by the sounds of it, they are already starting to, the drinks. No? Good. Uh, we'd love to see you guys after if, you, if you're interested. Um, we're all about uh, modern data quality pretty much all the way from uh, um, f figuring out what's the health is of your data systems all the way to the prevention of problems. And that's really where contracts comes in. Um, let's maybe continue with with introductions, I don't know, uh, Amy, Max, uh, Andrew, Amy, maybe you can go next. Sure. Uh, my name is Amy Raigara. I work for Swiss Marketplace. I've been working with data for over 19 years and before that in software engineering. I currently do uh, data product ownership in, um, as I told you, Swiss Marketplace. And we work a lot with data governance, um, data mesh, and some other topics. Cool. Maybe I can go next. So I'm Max. Um, I am currently Associate Director of Data Engineering for the data platform of HelloFresh. Mm -hmm. um, I have a large background in data engineering myself. Um, spent, I think, almost seven years at Zalando before I moved over to HelloFresh. Um, and basically always been focusing on building data platforms and allowing data teams to become more efficient in what they are doing. And that also drove me straight into the hands of data contracts. Cool, um, and I'm Andrew. I'm a principal engineer at Gokalis. Uh, my background, half of it was more software engineering, the first half, and the second half moved more into data engineering, data infrastructure, data platforms. Uh, been at Gokalis now for six years, building out the data platform there. Um, and a few years ago, we decided to do things slightly differently, and that's where we started coming up with data contracts and kind of came up with that term. Uh, and more recently, I've written a book about data contracts as well. Awesome. We're going to use uh, quite some terms, terminology, so let's maybe start with a few definitions. Data mesh, data products, data contracts. I mean, two people have written books about these things, so uh, let's start with uh, you, uh, Max. So you wrote um, uh, Data Mesh in Practice, I think it's yes, uh, called. Yes, that's correct. So could you maybe try and define Data Mesh real quick? Real quick? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, let me give it a try. So basically, Data Mesh is trying to address scaling challenges of data, not from a technological angle, but from a organizational angle. Right. So a lot of the things that we haven't cleared out over the past couple of years is around how do we actually properly take ownership around data? Right. Like how do we properly define what is actually the purpose that we are using our data for? Um, uh, but also then how we leverage the capabilities that we have to support that, right? How do we set up our organization so that you have properly defined owners? But also, if you are asking people to do more for the data that they own, you also need to give them the right tools to get the job done, right? That is also where my part for the data platform comes in, um, because you really want to ensure that you give the right tools to the people um, to get into that part. Nice. Amy, would you mind taking the data products definition? Sure thing. I mean. What is a data product? That's uh, very broad, right? For everybody, it's different. But you know, it's basically how you bring data already curated and ready to be used to provide self-service analytics um, in the most easiest way, as he said, with the right tools and in the right manner. Nice. And the author of the uh, book, uh, <laughs> uh, it was um, how to improve data quality with data contracts? Yeah, driving data quality with data contracts. Yes, so fantastic. Would you mind taking that one, Andrew? Yeah, sure. So I think leading on from those two definitions, you can think of data contracts as a way to do, implement data mesh and to provide data, data products to the organization. Um, so it's partly on the tooling that kind of enables that transformation, but it's not just the tooling. It goes hand in hand with um, kind of the the changes you make to organization to reassign responsibility and ownership, promote autonomy, and start providing good quality data products uh, to customers in your business. Nice. So let's uh, maybe des so describe the problem that we're trying to solve. And I'll try to summarize it in my own words, and then we can uh, uh, continue with the panel. Um, so in my own words, we're ultimately all trying to build high quality, reliable data products. That's what it's all about. 
but unfortunately, it's not that easy. Uh, we have upstream of us a lot of data coming in and being managed by different teams, uh, and they uh, their business changes, right? So they introduce change. It's normal, right? But uh, how we manage that change is uh, currently results in a lot of kind of. We call them breaking changes, as it were, right? They break things downstream, uh, everyone's firefighting. Uh, it's a very annoying place or environment or situation to be in. Um, and that's really, I think, the essence. And uh, if I kind of understand the contract definition well, it is all about aligning on a way of working that improves on the situation and with a focus on communication, really, right? So I wonder, Andrew, how did kind of data contracts uh, come about at GoCardless and, and why? Yeah, so at GoCardless, we started, um, like I mentioned, I joined um, about six years ago as kind of a person tasked to build out our data platform. So I kind of did it in the way that was most common at the time. So we built, like, I changed our capture service. It basically sucked all data into our data warehouse and said, data people, yeah, there you go, go and get, provide value. Um, but that kind of worked, I guess. But I had meetings regularly with data scientists, with uh, BI engineers, BI analysts, and I kept hearing about things going wrong, like week on week on week. And eventually, I decided thinking, oh, there must be a better way to be doing this. So like, why? How can it be successful if it go wrong so often? Um, so I started thinking about like that as a problem, and I've kind of leaned on my um, my software engineering background. I was thinking, well. The main problem is really we're building on top of these databases that are owned by the product teams. And of course, like I said, of course they're changing. They're supposed to change. They are delivering new features. They are scaling. They're doing what they need to be doing. But it's almost like it's not a stable environment to build on. So I started thinking, you know, for software engineering teams, you would have, uh, you would never build a small database. You would have an API. I was thinking, why is it different for data? Um, and I don't think it should be. So that's kind of where, you know, API is kind of like a, um, a contract between a producer and a consumer. For maybe one same for data, call it data contracts for better or worse. Um, and yeah, that's kind of a journey. So it's all about solving that problem of like these constant breaking changes. Add a bit more discipline to how we generate data. Um, and we did that because data is important to a business. Um, you know, we're using this data to drive models that end up driving revenue. So it's important to a business, therefore we should pay a bit more attention to how we're generating it um, and put improve quality at the source. Not try and work around downstream, but at the source. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, Max, for you guys at HelloFresh, how did that come about? So from the data journey of HelloFresh, um, it has always been, well, data was always been like a core asset for the organization and like it's one of our core values as well to, to explicitly make data-driven decisions in our day-to-day -day life, which of course puts like a pretty high pressure on like where the data is coming from and how it is treated along the way, right? And we actually tried to address the, the data quality topic already quite some time ago um, from multiple different angles. The first thing that actually happened was like some initial agreements uh, were being made um, to, yeah, facilitate how teams are communicating with each, other, with each other and how to set expectations on the data. And that happened on paper and that worked for a month or two and then things started derailing and it started drifting off because there was no technical enforcement to it. Right? The next thing that we did was we took it the other way around. We introduced a technical solution, soda, um, to, uh, to data quality management. Right? We implemented a lot of tooling and support internally to help people set up data quality checks. But then we realized this, on the other hand, is still a bit too technical. And we are losing parts of the audience because the effort required to set up everything is still a little bit too high. And they don't have the right incentives to actually do that. Because the people that produce the data that have to put in the effort are not the ones that actually reap the benefits afterwards. Right? And this is basically where we are now at, where we are actually moving into the space of data contracts, um, where we are working on, on very few selective use cases at the moment, where we set up a, what I love to call config-driven automatable data contract, uh, where we are basically moving into the direction that you have a standardized way of how a data contract is defined, um, that is on the one hand side still very easy to read and to comprehend and of course also to fill so that you don't need to be an engineer with like 10 years of experience um, just to like get the job done. But on the other hand, that it's still machine readable, 
and that then we as the data platform can come in and automate all the things that are actually required to set up the checks for you, to set up the notifications, to set up an incident process around that in case some data SLOs are actually breached. And this is the angle that we are now taking when we're looking at data contracts. Makes sense. And Amy, for you guys, how did that go? Yeah, <clears throat> sorry, for us, um, was a little bit different. We started with the data mesh journey. And of course, you know, I was reading a lot about data contracts. I had a conversation with our architect. And we decided to start with the first uh, data product and the first domain, introducing the data contract. And we started from the technical side of things. We had a lot of templates also in Notion for the non-technical people that are still, as you said, quite difficult for them to really understand. But we did all the implementation in already from the back end uh, to be able to get notified, you know, the data team if something changes. And then we have also another contract where you actually um, get with the consumer in touch if something is changing. So eventually, you know, there this will spark a conversation in between the teams. Um, that's what we hope, actually. Um, you know, and start this, um, this communication that is going to become more naturally at some point. But we have enforcements in GitHub right now that will get, it will, uh, you know, trigger an alert and the people will know that something will change. And the reason behind this for us to implement it is because as well as everybody else, we saw a lot of issues with data quality, um, columns being dropped in the back end, then people will lose it, the um, dashboards will break, it's just a mess. What happened, no one knows until you really go deep and you understand it was in the back end. And that's what we wanted to avoid with this. So we still have a lot of improvements to do, of course, but we have a solution that is implemented so far, but we would like to take it to the next level and uh, bring more stakeholders to be you know, the owners and being able to actually own this product and always initiate these conversations without the need to have this alert every time. So it will become naturally this conversation, you know, this flow from top you know, to the, to, from the back end to the data team. Very nice, makes sense. So uh, let's kind of dive into that technical architecture, into that implementation, because it's always nice. We've, ta we've talked about the concepts, right? So let's see how this works. Um, Andrew, because uh, yeah, you've created it, so uh, you can start. Yeah, so this is how we implemented data contracts at GoCarless. Um, so if you go to the next slide, yeah. So the data contract is defined in code um, in the infrastructure layer. So we, I was really keen for the data contract to be defined exactly where the data generator is expected to be defined. So next to where they define the infrastructure, the APIs, things like that. Uh, so that's some code they generate, they, um, they write. Um, they then merge it to a Git repo, and they have some CI checks there to make sure that the contract's valid, uh, make sure we're not introducing a break and change, things like that. Um, but then they can merge it to a Git repo, and they can do that with full autonomy. That's no review from a central data team, from a central data governance team, from me, from anyone else. Full autonomy. It's their contract, it's their data. They decide what it looks like, and they decide when to make a change to it. Um, and on merge to that, to that Git repo, a few things happen. Have on the top half of that diagram, we deploy a number of services and resources in Google Cloud. We're using Google Cloud, so in Google Cloud. Uh, so that'd be a BigQuery table. That schema matches a contract. Uh, a pop up topic, that schema matches a contract again. Um, and some services around the, the data as well to allow them to manage that data, kind of the governance side, and to automate a lot of that away. Um, we're saying like, this is their data, it's their BigQuery table, it's their pop up topic. Um, they can make whatever change they like to it, give people access to it, but we're not letting them do that. You know, they'd have to do all that on, uh, on their own. We're not going to all be experts in GDPR. That's, that wouldn't be a great idea. So we automate a lot of the governance around it, with GDPR and data handling, uh, access controls, backups, things like that, trying to make it as easy as possible for data generators to generate a data contract. Um, the end goal will be for it to be as easy as creating an API for them. Um, but all of this is kind of, yeah, it's very, it's kind of isolated in a way. Um, yeah, it's very big table, it's in very Google Cloud project. Um, and that's intentional, that kind of isolation, that autonomy promotes a great sense of ownership yeah, it's your table, your data, you're providing it to the business. Um, but we obviously, we don't want data to be siloed. So we also populate a number of central services, like a data catalog, um, central alerting and dashboards and metrics and things like that. Um, and because we're using BigQuery, and the same is the same for like, other modern sort of data warehouses like Snowflake and whatnot, there's no penalty to, to um, querying across those different projects and different data sets. Um, so that 
it's only there really for, for ownership and for like to promote the sense of ownership and autonomy. Um, but there's no penalty to, to query across that. So you can always query across different data sets. You can always bring it together to create your dashboards, create some insights, create your models. Um, so it's isolated, but not siloed. Nice, thank you. Amy? Uh, sorry, just one more. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, one more, so just a final on that. That's kind of how it's implemented, but we've been very deliberate about how we implement it to try and promote an architecture that looks more like this one. So going back to what Amy said about data products, we're trying to provide data products that are of good enough quality from data generators to use for our data consumers. We're leaving them a lot closer together. So if you're generating data about, um, in our case, maybe about payments, um, and that data needs to be used for some sort of important business process or to generate some reports on how the company's doing, they can use that data straight away. Um, don't need to go for a BI layer for that. Obviously, we still have BI, and we, that's more for joining data across different domains, different data products. Um, but yeah, red data products should be good enough quality for them to be used directly. Awesome, Amy. There you go. Yeah, for us, it starts a little bit different. Um, first, we start with the data product canvas, usually trying to understand what kind of products we need, what are the sources, where, where are we getting the data from. And then we fill out this template that you can see here uh, with the domain, what is the schema, um, what is the schema evolution, and also what is the GitHub link to this um, specific data contract. And can you go to the next slide, please? Oh, ah. <laughs> she left. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, um, Out of range. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. So basically, what we do is enforce it uh, using GitHub. So we have the web service on the back end. Then um, we have there basically a GitHub running some tests in the way the schema was you know, designed. If something fails because they changed something in the back end, it will automatically trigger an alert. And then this will let know, you know the owner of this pipeline, like the data engineer and the data product owner, that there is a problem there. And then the backend engineer and, the, and, and this domain need to start a conversation because this will impact the, the raw data that will produce this uh, curated data set. And on top, on the curated data set, we have the same mechanism, but with a subscription base. For example, if you would like to access this data set, you will need to subscribe to the GitHub data contract and also to the, well, to get access to the GCP for this data set. So it's a way like you, you, you cannot get subscribe only to Instagram and Facebook, you need to do both. So pretty much that's the logic. So basically, in this way, um, we make sure that these people is informed that something is happening so they can also raise their hand and eventually you know, say, OK, look, this is not going to work. You're dropping this column, or you are changing this data type. You're going to break our dashboard, or something is going to happen. Or, for example, we can des decide to have a version 2. So we do version of data products as well. We can have version 1, 2, or 3, and then decomize the ones that doesn't work anymore or create a new data product because it's going to change so much that the person you know, in the other domain might need something totally different. So that's how we are uh, working as of now. Makes a ton of sense. Max, how does that work at HelloFresh? Yeah, so uh, generally speaking, the approach is rather similar. So it all starts with the contract, of course, um, which is like the base agreement um, where you define what are the expectations um, that others can have on the data that you're publishing. Um, and what are the specific guarantees that you want to give, right? One particular point that I want to highlight here, though, is that basically we, have, we are taking it like from two different angles, uh, which I always like to call uh, pre-flight checks, uh, which is like things uh, like you folks have just described, right? Like when, when there's a schema that's supposed to change and that actually breaks something in production, that's something that you can prevent before the change happens, right? If you know that somebody relies on a column and somebody wants to remove that column, that is something that you can immediately reject right from the start, and that's exactly what we're looking at, where we're basically saying, like, why, when the contract is uh, supposed to be changed, there's some automated validation, and there can be some, some rejection of, like, whatever changes are proposed there, um, or if everything goes fine, you go to the next steps. And that is where like, the data is then actually created, right? It's the, where like, your data pipelines are running, uh, where your data is written somewhere. But then there's yet another angle to that in terms of providing guarantees on the data about the actual content of the data, right? And this is 
surprisingly, even the one that we started from, um, and we are only moving over to the uh, to the pre-flight checks afterwards. Uh, but we really came from an angle of saying we are checking the quality and the content of the data after it has already been written, right? These are things like, has the data been in time? Um, these are things like, is the data complete? These are things like um, checking specific distribution values in certain columns, right? Like, I don't know, um, if you're always expecting to have 20% market share from the US in your sales data, and tomorrow it's only five, that is a problem, right? Um, that is a very clear indication that something needs to be investigated. And even going so far that we say we want to drive a bit more towards like, let's say anomaly detection, where we do comparison between like what we have written today towards like previous state, where we can also see that there has been like significant deviations um, in terms of like how the data is structured and how the data is distributed. And these are basically the two main different angles that we are taking this from, um, including full integration with notifications, alerting, incident management, uh, where basically like whenever a data SLO is breached, the owner of that data set gets paged, um, but also the stakeholders get informed. Right? This is like super important that whenever you're waiting for something and you want to process the data, you might already have triggered your automated process, but then learning early that something has broken and that somebody's on it and fixing it is still super valuable. And yeah, we had cases where things were broken for many months and nobody realized, right? And this is exactly what we're addressing with this point right now. Makes a ton of sense. So let's go into the hard part of all of this. The change to making sure we can actually get there, uh, to make sure that we create that culture, that operating model, those behaviors uh, for this to actually uh, work. And um, maybe I'll pick in on something that you said earlier, Max, that um, you know, the, the, a part of the reason why you did this at HelloFresh is to also help kind of reduce the, um, the friction or kind of the, the barrier to entry, uh, provide more value to your um, uh, data platform users. So could you, would you mind elaborating a little bit on that? And Amy, Andrew, feel free to just chime in and pick up on uh, any of things. No, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, as mentioned before, like we were largely driven through the efforts required and the impact generated by what we were putting in place, right? Coming from the, the two different angles that we did before, the one thing didn't really work because we couldn't enforce it. The other thing created too much effort for the people that were supposed to put it in place, so they didn't have any incentive to really put in the effort to get the work done, right? And that, like, combining that and, like, aiming much more for simplicity um, is helping us in two angles from that side. Because on the one hand side, we are reducing the efforts um, and actually making the job much, much easier. Again, like going away from needing to define your infrastructure and set up your checks and uh, do your notification setups by yourself, um, but just define a template and then the platform takes care for you of the remaining parts, right? And then with, the, with that, with removing a lot of the effort required to actually do that, we are also strongly increasing the incentives um, for actually people to care about the data quality, right? Before it was always like, hey, do I do this business feature or do I set up data quality for this data asset, right? And if this is a trade-off, then something is fundamentally wrong, right? And yes. that is like where on the one hand side, also the business has changed a lot, right? We've seen some impactful data quality incidents over the past couple of months and years. And like only the, the tip of the iceberg is really surfacing when it comes to that. And you don't really know what are all the things that are happening in the day-to-day -day activities that are like silently fixed by someone that observed it, or sometimes even not fixed at all and only surfaced like many months after. And again, like simplifying this here also increases the incentives for people um, to actually take care of that in combination that now we also have like much higher incentives from a business angle as well. Not sure if you guys want to... Sure, yeah, on the topic of accountability, I think um, what I was talking with you guys the other time, it's not even how complicated is the technical side to be implemented, because if you have a good architect or a good data team, which I have actually, um, it's not about how complicated it is to implement it because it can be done very quickly. But the mentality change from the business people, from the stakeholders, from the accountability of data ownership and follow-up things and provide even business use cases to create these kind of anomaly detection 
this is one of the hardest challenges that you can see in order to implement a good uh, data contract, also uh, data governance framework and all these kind of things. So I think this is the, the most uh, challenging side of things and simplifying definitely will uh, drive you there, but it's very slowly. Like in our side the enforcement, I said is with GitHub and, and some notifications, but you know, this is like the being very tough and blocking already, you know, going to prod. But eventually, the idea will be to spark this collaboration naturally. So you will never have to get these notifications because then the product manager from the back end will come to you, hey, look, we're going to do these changes. Is it something that is going to impact you? Then you can take, you said, yeah, well, we can do this and that, we can change it. Or no, please don't do it. Or can we do something different? And then you have this more naturally happen, this, this flow. And documentation as well is very important because then if you have everything, all the flows, uh, if you know your domain and know who is your producer and you know who's the owner, it's much easier to be in contact because otherwise you are alienated and changes happen and just break things. So. Let me chime in on that uh, once more because there's uh, something that just popped in my mind, which is currently we're in the process of like planning our yearly activities for the next year, right? So like huge alignment process across the whole organization, dependency management, bunch of stuff, and I'm talking to a bunch of stakeholders at the moment to, uh, who have a strong interest to make improvements in the data quality space and who are looking for something like data contracts as a tool. Whatever I ha whenever I have these conversations with them, um, it's coming from an angle of, yeah, like these are the plans of what we want to do from the platform. How do we want to make this simpler? But you folks are the ones that actually have the need, right? Like there is a business case that leads you to provide, uh, to ask for better quality of the data that you are actually consuming. And these use cases, these business uh, use cases can even be um, broken down in like, dollars impacted, right? Because it's actually things like where we are like, hey, if this is breaking every two months like it currently is, this creates this much of damage in dollars. And um, the other way around, if we can 100% rely on this and build this use case on reliable data, this creates this amount of value. And this is like, I really love the point that you, that you made there. Every single implementation of this needs to be connected to a business use case and needs to actually have the incentive of the people uh, to push for it right from the start. Yeah, actually, I can share like a quick uh, example, like our monetization team, uh, we were migrating from on-prem to the cloud and we were working on a big project, but you know, the metrics that were implemented were not as good as they should be, so they were getting you know, pretty bad data. And they didn't want to collaborate with real test cases for these metrics, things that you actually need in order to create the new ones and make it in a good way. And there was a lot of back and forth with them until you know my boss had to escalate it a little bit to get them push and work on it. But actually now they are the biggest advocate about adding, you know, I want this quality, so let's work together, let's test together with the cell sheets so we get the right numbers. It, it took a lot actually, you know, it's, it's, it's about even getting things escalated uh, sometimes for them to really understand the need of this. And now they're happy with a lot of data. Of course, there's still a lot, a lot of things that are not good, but you know, the things that were rebuilt actually now make sense and they are quite happy, so they are more, Eagle to, eager to, to collaborate. And when they meet me sometimes on the road, uh, on the, on the halls uh, in the office, they are like, oh, Amy, maybe you can uh, talk to, you know, to someone in uh, another business unit because, you know, we would like to do something similar with them, blah, 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 blah. And it's nice to see that actually it was, you know, impactful in a way for them. And now they have more, you know, more uh, consciousness about the need of them providing us with something so we can do whatever they need because we can, we are technical people whatever they think they want is not what we understand. So we will do whatever we think is right, so. Makes a ton of sense. Let's um, dive into this concept of kind of freedom and flexibility versus control and governance. Uh, I think, uh, so the, I think one of the statements or kind of mantra is that uh, go cardless, uh, you, own the, um, you own the data, right? So you fix it <laughs> is uh, one of the statements. So. Andrew, how do you think about um, kind of layering in control and uh, up to what level do you need to do that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I'm really keen on autonomy. It's like the word I use probably most at work. Because um, I really think about autonomy is in, it's really important when you're trying to promote a sense of ownership. Yeah, and we're saying like, we trust you to provide the right data to consumers. If you talk to them, 
work out what you need to do, then you should go ahead and do that. We shouldn't have to gatekeep you or, or get in your way. Um, we did provide kind of guardrails, like I said, the kind of um, the CI checks, the, um, the automation around how they handle data, um, support them as much as possible, but we really want to like give them full autonomy, give them trust. Um, I think that's the only way that we can really give them that sense of ownership and responsibility. It comes naturally when you, you're building something that you're proud of, you deliver to another team, that together you're providing value to a business, that kind of value chain. Um, for them to be incentivized being part of that. One way to incentivize them to be part of that is by giving them that sense of ownership of that value that's being created in business. Yes. Do you guys have opinions there? Want anything you wanted to add? Maybe one, once more from my side to, to advocate a little bit for the platform-driven approach, let's say. <laughs> there was a talk here in the morning on this very stage of uh, two of my colleagues who were presenting our unified data platform and how we are generally taking an approach to, to simplify the data journey as much as possible on, on every single angle of that. Um, and that basically means by now we already have teams who, who create data pipelines through configurations. And of course, with the whole concept of like conflict-driven data contracts, that fits right in there, right? Like we actually say, whatever tooling we have, data product is not like some independent thing that we do next to that at the side, but it's like fully integrated in all the other things that we have as well, right? So the moment you set up your data pipeline, it comes with uh, certain data quality checks out of the box, right? You just need to say like which dimensions make sense and which parts of the data should be monitored and you just get that for free. You don't even need to do anything on top of that. Um, but same when it comes to data ingestion mechanisms, right? Like where the data is originally coming from. We want to set that up. When somebody configures something to come in, we want to do these like pre-flight checks before the data is even arriving. So like everything that we are trying to do is really to build like this, this unified version of the data platform with like a single entry point for your data journey and data contracts fit right in there because it's exactly the same approach for us. Yep. Yeah. Yes, makes a ton of sense. So it's, um, it's clearly a lot of this is about um, the people, process, the ways of working, the culture, behaviors, all of that. Um, technology does play a role. Uh, we've mentioned uh, tools like uh, um, incident management, alerting, cataloging, et cetera. Um, what for, for you kind of, what are the, the, the tools maybe beyond that or, or are those the tools that, that you need to make this all happen or is there more? Are there tools on your wish list? No. Will, Will the tooling landscape, because of data contracts, evolve in a certain way? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, I think some tooling becomes more important when you move to a date contract or date product or date mesh kind of world, where no longer do you have like every data issue. You just say, hey, BI, why is it broken? And, they, and expect them to go and run around and fix it as best they can. Uh, <laughs> um, but now like, data is owned by many different parts of business, so then the ability to discover that data, to find out who owns it, to find out what is powering the kind of lineage of it becomes more important. So I think data catalog and data lineage become a bit more important if you're not using them already. Um, we're quite early in our journey on that. We're still kind of working out how best to do that, but I think um, we're kind of moving towards that. And I think with data contracts really, it's kind of a source of truth for, for data, for kind of what expectations are, the SLOs, things like that, uh, how the structure of the schema, the semantics, things like that. Um, so really I would like to see data catalogs being driven by the contract rather than like a catalog to like, try and scan your, your data warehouse and just try and infer what's in there, be a lot more deliberate about it. Um, which is what we've done at GoCard, we've covered a little very simple data catalog in our uh, engineering portal, it's like we use backstage from Spotify as an engineering portal. We can't build a very simple, back, a very simple catalog in there uh, driven by data catalogs. But I think there's potential for more tooling to be driven by the data contract, you know, like our data handling tooling, like our data catalog. Yeah, um, in our case, um, our BI lead, she's investigating about DVT and the data contracts in this new package that is coming to see how we can integrate it also with Atlan. 
and eventually we would like to take it there, um, you know, to get also the owners, the metrics that we already put in there together. So it's much easier, you know, to to access it. And now also they are releasing this new uh, data mesh uh, package for Atlan. So we would like to try it out and see how we can bring it in a more easier way, you know, to the stakeholders, to the non-technical people, to access the data products, to uh, understand how it works and see also the contracts and they can subscribe in there. But we're still waiting for these features to be released and try to take it to the next level hopefully early next year. Nice. Now, I, I love that part, honestly, because if, if in my um, strive for simplification, I would only double down on these things and actually say, um, I want to have this, not even right now, you need to have, do it on GitHub, you need to be able to run a Python CLI to do the pre-configurations. Um, Let's go beyond that. Let's have a UI on top of that. That makes it as simple as possible um, so that you don't need to have anything anymore that is required to get that done. Makes sense. I think it, uh, the authoritative source of all of that information and it becomes a contract. And we do it as part of our data product development. So that's, I think, a fundamental mind shift. So we, uh, we did it always after the fact because you know that's all we had. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, everyone. Let's see if there's any uh, questions in the audience. Yeah, thank you. Um, the pre-flight checks and then they say it's broken. Um, I miss any possibility of my uh, like schema evolution. So the, how is contract evolution seen if you compare that to APIs which you simply might version like V1, V2? And if so, how do you sunset an older version in relation to stakeholders that might be on different versions at the same time, yeah? Yeah, honestly, exactly the same thing. <laughs> you want to have versions for your data contracts as well, and you want to have mm -hmm. versions for your data, right? So like you want, of course, data contracts are not meant to block you from change. They are meant to be a tool to facilitate the change, right? Mm -hmm. They are meant to make you aware of who are your stakeholders that you that are impacted by this change that you need to communicate with, right? Amy mentioned this earlier. Yeah. Ideally, you even want to be in a situation that you that your product manager from that needs to make the change talks to the stakeholders before they even attempt to make that change, right? And like this is like I think much more the angle that you should see it from. It's it's a tool to prevent catastrophic breaks in production to happen, but it's also just like the final measurement. Um, of all the communication that should happen before that already. Yeah. Yeah, and for that data owners and data governance in place is super important because without that it's, it's very hard to find who owns what and what changes are going to do and why it, it broke or, you know. Yeah. Will we take... Test. Okay, we're back, we're back, we're back. Maybe one or two more questions, anyone? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to go super crazy on you, but um, so you were talking about that. That oh, sorry, uh, you were talking about that whole process of um, trying to prevent these these changes from from breaking. How do you provide the tooling into the actual developers so that they can test these things? Because what we're seeing a lot of times is they don't know who is consuming. They know somebody is consuming but they don't know who, they don't know how to actually facilitate that conversation. How are you seeing that actually manifest in a way that's scalable? Yeah, you had this great approach with the subscription model. Maybe you can elaborate a bit on this. Yeah, the, the, at, at least with the curated data pr uh, product, because you know you have the domain that it's the uh, stream aligned, so that's very clear who's the owner, and you know there is a contract that's still there for the backend person, so they know that these uh, people is the, the the domain is consuming directly. But then for the curated data set, there is another contract. So you subscribe for the changes in GitHub. So you get these alerts all the time if something changes. Well, no, hopefully not all the time. It won't bar <laughs> it would change that often. But you will get the, the um, sorry, you will get this um, information out of it. And you get access to the curated data set. As I said, you need to subscribe to both. Um, otherwise, it won't, it won't work. Because if you let the people start using it, then how would they know when this change, right? 
I was speaking actually with another colleague here and we were talking about the scalability of this. Uh, we haven't had the chance to get there yet because I think it might be a bit complicated when you have many people consuming from one data product. But you know, those, cha those challenges will be overcome whenever they are in front of me. As I told you in the podcast the other day, like let's cross that bridge whenever it needs to be crossed. Not, <laughs> not, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, a final question, anyone? No, no, no. All righty. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And uh, see you maybe for drinks. Uh, oh, yes, and also a survey.